Recording in progress. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and we're back in the studio with a special guest with uh, over Zoom. Uh, somebody that is this will be the first time we've had a guest on the show that both has a Wikipedia page and an IMDb listing uh, on the internet. So I'm, I'm super excited to talk to our guest, uh, Sarah Price, a professional racer, stunt woman, and extraordinary person all around. How are you doing? Good. How are you guys? I'm glad to, glad to be on the show. Yeah, thanks for being here. You just got back from an epic long trip from uh, Chile, correct? I did. We were out in Chile racing Extreme E with Chip Ganassi Racing, and I got back yesterday. Or the day before, maybe the days are really messed up. Right now. <laughs> yeah, last time I talked to you, you were uh, mixing up your time zones too. So I can imagine uh, being a world tread setter, you're uh, you're kind of mixed up sometimes. But uh, yeah, so you were doing some extreme e. We're going to get into that a little bit, but uh, give us a little rundown for those that might not be super familiar with uh, what who you are, what you do. Uh, we'll dig into the history here in a little bit, but uh, let me know who you are and where you're out of and and all that. Yeah, so my name's Sarah Price, and I'm a professional off-road racer. I started off in motocross, went to four wheels, and raced side-by-sides heavily in a Polaris Razor, um, as well moved into trophy trucks. Um, have, you know, had an incredible time now in trucks. I, I won the 2019 Baja uh, Sport National Championship in trophy truck spec. And then now I'm racing for Chip Ganassi Racing in Extreme E, and as well as the Stunt Woman, and business owner and kind of do a lot, a lot of stuff. <laughs> so uh there's so much to unpack in that little statement that you just gave that elevator pitch has a lot to unpack there um but let's start a little bit back to where your roots are um you were one of those uh people that started at a very young age in racing um and you started on two wheels uh give us a little background there yeah so i started racing dirt bikes at age eight um and really my parents didn't know what to do with me my brother raised dirt bikes and they didn't know what to do with their sister that they brought to the track for practice so they're like she has so much energy she's not scared of anything i was in the horses at time competing on horseback and so they got me my first dirt bike and so you were actually competing on horses before getting into moto yeah i was on horses my dad said it was too dangerous he said it's scary which now (laughs) uh, now he would say something different but uh Yep. Horses came first. So were you doing actual like riding competitions where you, you have to go around the course and do jumps and stuff or what were you doing? Exactly. So I was doing uh, show jumping. Um, I was also doing hunter jumpers as well as Jim Connor when I could and vaulting, which is gymnastics on horseback. Um, kind of had like a a horse facility, a horse camp used to go to. So kind of was well-rounded in the horse thing. Um, but definitely I found them first and then shaded in one horsepower for a few more. <laughs> so, so how young were you when you were given the trust to control a horse in that capacity? Because that's, I mean, we're talking about eight years old and I'm thinking about my kids that are my boys that are now, you know, uh, 12 and, and 15 or and yeah, I think that's how old they are. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think about some of the responsibilities that I do give them and afford them and some that I hold back just because of knowing where they're at mentally. Um, you know, eight, eight years old racing horses. I mean, how how soon did you start on that? And, and what was the kind of the decision point that your parents were like, yeah, that's go for it? Well, we actually moved to a place called Canyon Lake and I was in walking distance to the horse stables and I found my way there very fast. Uh, every single day when I got off school, I would go straight to the horse stables. And so my parents were kind of like, all right, so this girl's living at the horse barn and she really wants a horse. I begged them every single day. Eventually, um, I got a horse when I was, I was think like 12 and, um, you know, many years being at the barn and then got finally the horse and, uh, yeah, she was a crazy horse. I was a little (laughs) daredevil. And so even the horse trainer at the barn was just like, this kid's crazy. And so he put me on all like the misbehaving horses. Um, and he <laughs> actually, cause I had so much energy, he'd have me run around the arena before I hopped on the horse. So the horse didn't feel my energy and, uh, yeah. And it kind of just was no fear. So my parents, I just kind of dragged along with me for the most part. And 
you know, they always said that they'll support me in whatever I do, as long as I put a hundred percent effort into anything I do. So that, uh, that's, they stood by me the entire time in my career from horses to then when it came to motocross, you know, and motocross, it's a very, very tough, um, upbringing being on a dirt bike training 24 seven and basically have no life, but training that's, that's what racing is in a motorcycle. And I can imagine that coming from horses where you're having to manage this massive beast under you, you know, that generates a new respect for balance and, and, and the acuity of, of moving on, on a moving object. Uh, I would assume that that probably helped uh, catapult you a little bit into the moto racing. Oh yeah. hundred percent. I think uh, horses is a really good foundation for anything. And then, yeah, when it came to dirt bikes, it was kind of like, you know, my brother be out the track. He's five years older than me. And he's training on the big track. I'm on the peewee track. And my mom's just like, damn, this girl won't get off the track until she runs out of gas. And then, you know, I entered my first race and I won it. And then I was kind of like, all right, I want to keep racing, you know? And I had to do a choosing uh, a time in my life where I'd be like, okay, horses or motorcycles, you know? And it was a, that was a tough one to make, but it was easier to do the motorcycles because that's what my brother did and our family did. So. So when you start to get into uh, motocross, um, kind of at what point did it become more than just a weekend hobby and become more of an aspirational thing where you're like, hey, I want to push this further. I want to push this harder. We actually had um, some family friends that were watching me ride and I just started racing, obviously, and they were like, you need to take this girl to the nationals. I just moved up to 65s from 50 CC motorcycles and uh, I went to my first national and I won it. And so ever since then, it was kind of like, okay, we are fast. Like we're not just locally fast. We're fast world, you know, nationwide. So then I just was hooked. And then my parents were like, oh crap. Now we really have to go to a lot more. (laughs) She's going to be wanting to race everything. And they were exactly right. You know, I just kind of went for it and wanted to, uh, just race as much as I possibly could and moved up through the ranks and wanted to be, I remember all I wanted to be was Kawasaki team green. And, uh, now looking back, it's kind of crazy because I reached, uh, another level above that, which is factory Kawasaki and, um, was the first female in Kawasaki to ever do so. Yeah. So, so that's kind of a crazy transition. How, how was that time period where you were thinking, I'm trying to go fast. I'm trying to win. I just want to win every race to being, um, considered and, and courted by these sponsorships where they're saying, Hey, you know, we see something in you. Um, and you now take on that whole new responsibility of not only racing for yourself, but racing for a whole program, right? How, how was that time in your head? And, and cause I mean, you're still a teenager at that point. Yeah, definitely. I think growing up in the racing world, and especially when you had sponsors like that at a young age, you know, you, you have a different upbringing, you learn how the marketing side of things works and how you want to portray yourself, how your sponsors want you to portray yourself, your schooling that gets done on the road. Now, you know, like it was like, we were traveling nonstop. My dad would get off work. He would hop in the motorhome. We travel to Texas. We travel everywhere, kind of around the U S uh, sometimes he'd have to fly back. My mechanic would have to drive me to the next race and he'd just fly back out for the race. And it was a, a big family effort, but then also too, I had to do my part, right? I had to get the results. I had to keep sponsors happy. And I also, you know, had to keep training every single day on the road and, uh, we did it. We it definitely is a little bit more pressure when you have, uh, your dream sponsor finally happen. And, uh, but the one thing that was crazy about motocross is I was at the pinnacle of it for female motocross. And now it, it kind of diminished when X games took us out of the program. And so that left us with no future, no sponsors that were offering, you know, compensation to actually make a living doing it. So, you know, when I turned 18, after I turned professional at 16, my parents were kind of like, we thought there would be more of a light at the end of the tunnel for you. And we now need to think about this a little bit. So when you were younger, before you, before Kawasaki signed you over and, be, and, and you led into X Games, you actually went and competed and, and podiumed at X Games. Um, but before that, I mean, how was that struggle of getting sponsors for the road? Was that something that you got, you got, your family was continuously pursuing or was it more of a, it'll come when it comes, we're going to push through the hard times now? 
to say no matter what in racing sponsorship is uh always the struggle you're always trying to find sponsors you're always trying to get support and everything you possibly can so that was always a constant battle but i do think that back in the day when i was amateur before i turned professional um you know i'm going to all these races they see the effort that my family and i am putting into it i'm winning races um nationally everywhere and you know it came a lot easier because they have more of a support system when you're an amateur coming up until you reach pro then when you are pro and you've kind of made it it's that very slim chance and so they kind of want to upbring you with a lot more hope than when you make it so you know once you make it it's really tough you got to make sure you're one of the few that are going to be making it because uh if not it's just all that you know and you kind of have to make the most out of it yeah so during that time uh you went to x games you competed you podiumed x games was starting to blow up around that time it's starting to become like this massive juggernaut of a not only a sport system like an ecosystem but also a media system right um and so we started seeing a lot of influx of sponsorships and brands starting to tie in um you had a lot of these factory uh sponsors that were very much all in on x games during that time um, you know, when, when they cut women's cross out of it, uh, what did that change for your opportunities as a female athlete during that time? It changed everything. When X games first put us in, that also changed my life because a lot of the sponsors wanted to now be involved and compensate. And now we wanted to, I, I could finally figure out, oh, okay. When I, you know, get an apartment or I move out of my parents' house, I can afford it finally. But, um, in motocross, you don't have a break you don't have the ability to, okay, I'm going to work a, a job during the day and then I'm going to train at night. It doesn't work that way in motocross. It's a 24 seven job. You got to be at, in the gym. You got to be on your bike every single day, pretty much. So you, you can't really balance a work life with racing. It's uh, all or nothing. And so in motocross, you needed to figure out a way to make that money to obtain that. And that's a really tough thing to do in motocross. And then when X Games came along, it made it possible. And then when they took us out, it really made it tough. And uh, it was kind of crazy to see the world of women's racing kind of diminish right before your eyes. You know, all of us who thought there was so much hope to uh, make a true living doing this and career for the rest of our lives. It kind of was like, wow, maybe we need to think about this. You know, it's it's not quite uh, looking to be that way anymore. So. So during that time, you, you're you now kind of left with this open slate that you have to now repaint that picture. Um, you know, I know you had suffered a number of shoulder industry, uh, injuries during that time and had to have surgery and that took you out for a while. Uh, so you not only had this like lack of, of sponsorship and races to go do, you also had this injury and this time off from the sport, which like you were saying, having to constantly every day be honing your craft. Um, now you're out of that for a little while. Uh, what changes in your mindset and what changed in your life during that time? Yeah, that's the one thing about motocross is it's not if, it's when you get hurt. And yeah, I've had some really bad shoulder injuries. Um, they still affect me to this day, you know, and it's a constant rehab of the shoulders. Um, but driving, at least it's not as critical. So it doesn't bother me when I drive, which is nice. But uh, yeah, motocross is a tough sport. You got to overcome a lot of stuff. Um, you gotta be physically fit. You gotta be mentally fit and you gotta have the whole package. And it's just kind of, even if you do have it, some people still don't make it and it's a uh, pretty hardcore life. But, uh, what happened when X games took us out, I kind of was like, man, what do I do now? You know, like I have to have shoulder surgery. Um, I'm going to do that. I got invited to do a pageant and I was always wanting to show like the world of racing. Like you can be you can be the female and perceive that and then also be the racer, the hardcore racer on the track, you know, and kind of cross market. And I was trying to do anything I possibly could to be creative to get the possible sponsorships or attention needed to uh, continue racing dirt bikes. And uh, through that process, you know, I, I came back to racing. There's really nothing for me. And it made it really difficult. And my parents had that sit down with me like, hey, we got to think of something else. So then I started uh, painting cars. I started my own business. And I like remember setting it up and I'm going to make this much money a week. I'm going to pay for, you know, a house and I'm going to focus on that. And then I can buy my own car, a UTV, and then I can start racing cars. And that's what I did. 
I did exactly that. <laughs> so, so going from a racer to painting cars was was painting something you already had in your tool set chest, or was this something that you just dove right in and started learning from the very first day? My whole family is automobile painters and collision workers. So I grew up around it. And so it was something easily to obtain. And uh, so, yeah, I just started my own touch up company and uh, I just kind of I went for it. Like, you know, just started trying to get as much work as I possibly could and figured out how to make a a dollar because I didn't know what that really entailed in a real life. You know, I was used to the athlete side of things and that was all I knew. So yeah, it was a big transition. It was something new, um, but I did it. And then I bought my first Polaris Razor and I could afford a house now. I could go race this Razor and learn how to drive and then also prep it myself and buy the parts to prep it every weekend to be competitive in a series. And, you know, one thing led to another. Motocross was a great foundation to become a good racer in anything you possibly do. So uh yeah, it set me up for a lot of success in four wheels. So we've talked before on the podcast about how getting into motocross helps you transition into UTV because it helps you understand lines and helps you understand your selection process and uh, understanding the terrain and how it's going to affect you personally and how it handles with the car. Um, is that is that also what you found when you transitioned into UTV that it, you kind of had the mindset of like, I can I can see two lines here and I can see one's going to kill me and one's going to one's going to take me over the top. A hundred percent motocross. It sets you up to see terrain that most people won't even understand. And so you can just make a quick reaction. You know, you, you see a, a rut over there and you're like, oh, well, that's on the inside. It has a kicker in it. I'm going to stay over here. I'm going to do six inches to the left. It's a little better. But in a car, it is different. But I think having that baseline, you know, I have an advantage for sure coming into the driving scene without, um, you know, racing against people who don't have that background. I think I definitely had to step up in that. And then it was just learning how to set the car up and not a motorcycle because they are two different things to set up. (laughs) So you got into UTV, you went racer, you went with the racer platform. Um, was that a, a intentional decision at, at the beginning or was that just kind of like the one that you found and, and started going into? Um, actually I, yeah, my first car was the, uh, it was a 900, uh, Polaris razor and it just kind of worked out that way. My friend was working at a magazine. So that was the one I could buy. That was a competitive class and short course that was racing right by my house. So I figured, Hey, I'll go and race that. And, uh, so I did and it worked out awesome. Um, and then later on, I just wanted to keep climbing the ranks. I was doing the short course. I was doing works. I was doing all sorts of random events kind of in the side-by-sides. And then, um, I saw this rally in a magazine and I wanted to go do it. It was in Africa. And I asked one of my best friends, Erica, if she wanted to go with me. And she said, yeah. So then I had raced for Kawasaki for a long time. And I, uh, I went there and was like, Hey, I want to do this race. You guys want to support me. And they're like, yeah, we'll we'll give you a car to go to Africa. And then we're like, oh, crap. So then we're doing a rally in Africa. (laughs) And then I was racing the Terex for uh, a few years. And we tried to do everything we possibly could in that platform. But uh, the Kawasaki was a little bit behind when it came to racing and the speeds of other cars. So um, then we jumped back into the Polaris where we were more competitive in classes. Is that when you went to the turbo class or was that like straight to the 1000s? Uh, they still didn't have the turbo class out. So, um, we were in the Terex, but, uh, the Polaris NA was 1000 at the time. And yeah, even though the, the Terex was, uh, I think it was an 880 or a 900, but it, it didn't quite compare because they're a lot heavier and they didn't have the top speed as a Polaris where they're a lot lighter and more agile. So, so you went into the the razor platform once again, and then you started moving forward and then you started eventually doing things like King of Hammers. Like what was that transition like between, you know, I want to just go see how I can perform in 900s to going across the world to Africa. And, and then, and, well, before I get into that question, how was Africa? What was that rally like? Oh, Africa was amazing. It was a nine day race. Um, this is like the Dakar Sahara. style, right? Like where you're just simply going from one side of the country to the other side. Pretty much. It's still different. It was based off a of dead reckoning navigation. So basically, um, it's off of a old outdated map and a compass and you have to plot around mountains and you have to make a designated route and it's not off of speed. It's off of distance. So it's off of your strategic play of how you're going to map it out. 
And so, yeah, we had a lot of learning to do to do this. And it was uh, it was a crazy ride. We were the first U.S. American team to do it in the side by side. So that was pretty cool. And um, yeah, we we got lost a lot, but <laughs> we, uh, we we had memories to last a lifetime from that. That's for sure. It wasn't the days of the, the low rents and, and everything else on the dash, <laughs> just helping you get through the grace. No, we're not allowed any of that. They take away anything that possibly has a signal of GPS or anything. So our phones get locked away. Um, our cars absolutely have nothing on them that can uh, communicate with anything. <laughs> so being out in the middle of a, a country you've never been to, in the middle of a a, a, wa- a vast wasteland of, of, you know, basically wilderness, uh, what was that feeling like being paired up with, with your girlfriend to get this thing done and, and, and get from point A to point B? Was that any type of concern or was it just a matter of race focus, go forward? It was just a matter of getting through and just kind of being like, all right, well, we'll figure it out and we'll handle it. You know, we had a lot of uh, things kind of coming our way, like the first day, which is prologue, which is practically like a practice. Our car got stuck in a snowstorm in Africa, so we didn't Wait, get they have it. snow in Africa? Yeah, I know. <laughs> we thought the same thing. I'm like, what is happening right now? Like, our car, we can't do practice because it's stuck in a snowstorm? Like, what? So, yeah, we didn't make practice. The next day, we were going to the wrong group because we didn't know how to tell the groups from the first day of practice. Uh, we didn't have the chance to learn all that, so we went to the wrong group and meaning we didn't get a fuel stop. And so we ran out of gas out in the middle of the desert. And so we pretty much slept <laughs> out there. It was a, it was an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine just randomly the side by side in the middle of an African desert, just kind of camping with the animals. That's crazy. Um, yeah. and so, so from there you moved on to bigger and crazier races and more, uh, aggressive racing. Uh, like I said, I led into the King of Hammers and, uh, at some point you got from, being this this racer that's just trying to to move up and figure out where their their place is in the sport to bringing on bigger sponsors and bringing in four wheel parts and and all these other guys how did that transition happen for you um i think what it was is just you know i put my all into everything and i think that uh sponsors see that i always tried to under promise and over deliver you know at times uh, especially in the last few years life has gotten crazy and there's been a lot of evolving a lot of adapting a lot of different things happening um but yeah i think uh you know i've built great relationships with companies that you know i consider family and you know i, I truly believe in them and that's why they're a part of my program and uh yeah it's it's pretty freaking awesome so going from uh course racing to you know to car style race rallies to you know king of hammers um is there one style that you prefer more than others when it comes to utv racing um i would say they're all pretty cool um i would say man utv is like i i don't know you can do everything in a utv so it's pretty cool like all the way around but uh, I wouldn't say there's one thing I like in particular. I like being well-rounded and doing everything. So it's kind of like whatever I can do to do the best I can result-wise, it's always the best feeling to do good when you work so hard at something. So, you know, it's uh, where I can work hard and come through and get the results in the end. So I think that goes to your personality of just wanting to achieve and uh, grow higher, bigger, stronger, further, overcome all the different obstacles along the way. Um, and that moves you out of UTV into trophy trucks like that, like you just continue this path of like progression into bigger, 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 bigger. Um, how did, how did that come around and, and what was that like going into your first trophy truck? Oh man, I had no idea I'd ever end up in a trophy truck, but like, was that something that you were pursuing was to get into a trophy truck or where you, did you think that UTV was kind of where you were going to settle in at? Um, I always like set my sights high, but I would say that there was one year, um, I raced in, uh, the stadium super trucks and I spent my whole savings to do so. And I ended up having a really good result and showing really good pace. And so then I got hired from another team to race trucks for the rest of the year. And then that's when I got the call from RPM to race the trophy truck spec. And of course, I'm not going to say no. And, uh, I just utilized the opportunity the most I possibly could to, to make it something successful, bigger and better. And uh, I did exactly just that. And, you know, obviously RPM uh, kind of picked me out on a limb and uh, we just made the most out of it and uh, showed them that we belonged there in a truck and were competitive. And then uh, 
next thing led to another. I got an actual trophy truck ride with Chattanooga whiskey that I'm still with now. And it just keeps uh, progressing, you know, but uh, unfortunately now trophy trucks are all wheel drive huge engines and if you're not in one of those it's really hard to compete and uh i haven't been in one of those yet so if there is any progression <laughs> that would be the only thing i could progress to at this point <laughs> well i think there's there's another level above that we'll we'll get to in a second but that's like one of the big arguments in in truck racing right now is the whole two wheel all wheel controversy where you know do they compete together should they be different should should we all just move to the other platform um, what's your take on that? Is that, is that something that's just the na nature of the beast? It just evolves and becomes this bigger, badder thing, or is it something that, um, you know, the purist would say, keep, keep, keep everybody separate, have everybody on the same playing field and, uh, and make it kind of bigger as an, as a industry, uh, by making more classes versus, you know, racing together. Yeah, I think it is. A, this is a big debate. I understand from both sides of it. It's an unlimited class. So people are like, you know, they should all be together. But then at the same time, when it's like everyone has to have that one all wheel drive truck right now, there's really only one all wheel drive company, um, Mason Motorsports, that can make a truck that lasts to the end right now. And I think they're past the point of where it's like, well, the all wheel drive trucks break. They're not quite there yet. Well, now they're there. And it's not a matter of, you know, if they're going to break, it is sometimes they're going to break. Yeah. But any truck does. And you just have four wheels compared to two hitting the ground. So pulling it's, it's completely different. And so I personally think that it should be four wheel drive and a two wheel drive trophy truck class. Cause it is a very different, um, realm of speeds and where the trucks excel and don't excel. And it's proven to be that, uh, you know, the best drivers are in two wheel drive and four wheel drives is still out beating them outright no matter what anymore so uh i am an advocate for the two wheel drive four wheel drive class 100 percent. but i understand the whole unlimited class trophy trucks but uh i think it would make it a lot more fun for a lot of people and the old trucks can still live and in a competitive way yeah and that i mean that that's a conversation that's also carrying over into utv where they now have these new polaris two two liter four cylinder motors and and all this and they're starting to create this unlimited class of their own um and they're being competitive with with trophy trucks they're there's they're putting down similar times um they're often being held up by a bigger truck that maybe had a part failure or something or or maybe just took the wrong line or whatever um, and so in the UTV community, there's definitely that discussion of should these guys be, you know, their own class. And, and then on top of that, uh, you know, we're starting to see a lot of the factory racers all going to that class, right? So they're sucking drivers out of these other classes into this unlimited class. Um, and so do you feel like, you know, progression is just going to make us, you know, grow as a community of racing and, and racers, or, or is there some, uh, some, I don't know what the word is. There's some reservation that should be had with, you know, depleting some classes to, to support a new class. Um, I think there is a, you know, evolution. Everything is getting bigger, better, faster. Um, and it's always going to be that way. It's racing. It's, you can't tell us, Hey, like we're going to put a speed limit on this and slow you guys down. It's like, we're going to figure out another way to go faster in the other spots. It's uh, I, I absolutely love the pro R. So I'm a big advocate for it. If I'm not in a trophy truck, I'll be in that thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's a light vehicle with a lot of power. It's agile. It's four wheel drive. Um, you know, when I'm driving the trophy truck, a two wheel drive trophy truck, I'm going through really tight areas. It's tough for the truck. It's not a fast truck when it comes to tight and technical areas in the truck because it's not. It's a big machine that you're trying to you know, get it rotated and it doesn't want to rotate over those things. It's meant to go really fast over big old bumps, you know, where these side-by-sides and especially the pro R can come in and it's just like point, shoot, turn, point, shoot, turn. You can stop it fast. You can get going fast and a truck's massive. It has a lot of weight against it. So these, uh, these pro R's are definitely going to give everyone a run for their money. And, um, I think that's going to be the elite class in side-by-side -side racing coming up and, you know, the 2000 CC is a great platform. Um, and I think obviously the other UTV classes are still going to live. I think they're going to be great competitive classes as well. But yeah, I think the pro R is definitely going to kind of head the way for the UTVs. 
Yeah. So when, when the pro R came out, we were on the forefront of, you know, figuring out this car and when it was coming out and what it was going to be. And, um, at, at, at this point in my perspective of the pro R is that, yeah, it's a consumer product for everyone to go out and have fun in. But I think it's really kind of like Polaris's focus of like, we're going to reinvigorate the racing scene with this new platform and kind of break down boundaries that we've all artificially let ourselves be captured by, um, and create a whole new era of UTV racing. Um, and I, and I think it's not even just UTV. I think Polaris definitely has a mindset of like, we're just going to take over racing, like not just, you know, UTV unlimited class. Like we want to give all the big guys a run for their money with a platform that is one tenth the cost of these big trucks. Um, and I think they're succeeding at that. And I can't wait for the other platforms to come up and be competitive with them. I agree. If you look at Polaris, they are the ones that definitely paved the way. They're not afraid to put out a new product with a lot more horsepower, a lot more cool things to add to what people want to want to have. And, uh, you know, you have like the Japanese companies, they're a little bit more reserved. They don't want to take the chances. They don't want to have any problems. And I think that's where Polaris is like, we want the best racing equipment there is out there. We want to rule this market and we want people to have uh, the ability to obtain those vehicles and I think that's really awesome and innovative of Polaris to push that market and to go for it as much as they do. Yeah, um, um, we're all definitely excited to see how it progresses, but it does bring up some of the same questions, like I was saying, about who they should be competing with, what classes and all that stuff. And then also, you know, taking some of the driver pool out and, and seeing how that leaves opportunities for other drivers. But uh, but what I was saying earlier is, is there's also this next step above that you've entered into where you're now driving you know, this electronic class truck kind of gives a rundown on, on what that is and, and who's behind it and, and what's going on there. Yeah. So currently I'm racing extreme me, which is an all electric SUV series and we race worldwide. Um, I race for a team called chip Ganassi racing, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of from NASCAR and IndyCar, even though they sold their NASCAR team now. But uh, yeah, it's a very competitive field and you have people that are now looking at off-road for the first time from F1. Um, you know, you have a lot of Dakar racers racing in our series and you have the best, the best names racing in a, a series where there's a male and female driver on every single team. So they're breaking the boundaries in a lot of ways. Um, and they did and that from the onset, like from the very beginning, like they're, they're just putting this out there. Like, this is the way it's going to be. It's going to be a 50, 50 split. Everyone gets a fair shake at this. A hundred percent. Yes. It's uh, they, they very much stand by what it means and it's pretty awesome. The series itself, I absolutely believe in, and I, I love it. I've been in it now for two years. Uh, we're coming into our last race this next month in Uruguay, which is, uh, uh, crazy part of the world, but, uh, <laughs> we just got back from Chile and now I'm like, wait, where are we going next? Um, but yeah, it's a incredible series. I'm super proud to be a part of it and the owners and their vision for what they have for the future is just unreal. So it's a, a pretty cool thing. And I'm grateful for it because I come from this side of the world where in the States we have American off-road. It's, it's different than anything else in the world. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, you know, you have the Dakar rally, it's still not the same as Baja or best in the desert or any of these races that we race here. The vehicles are completely different elsewhere. And so for the first time they're looking at our sport and what we do in off-road, um, to bring towards their side of the world. And it's, it's pretty awesome. That's definitely something that I've been intrigued by with extreme E is how they've kind of blended the two cultures of off-road where you have these big open race schemes of the other side of the world where it, but they have a little bit of more structure like the American side of the world. And then they have this amazing new platform where, you know, you can basically go as fast as you literally want, uh, you know, zero to 60 times on those things are insane. And then I think that those are all wheel drive trucks as well, right? Yeah, they're, uh, they're four wheel drive. So kind of give us a rundown. I mean, first of all, I'm, I want to get, I'm, I want to nerd out on the trucks a little bit, but second, before that, uh, this was like, you were the first signed woman into extreme media, correct? Yeah. I, I didn't know that. And then all of a sudden the announcement came out and I'm like, Oh, my first driver announced what? That's yeah. Crazy. And then you were, you also signed up next to Kyla Duke, right? Yeah. Kyla Duke is my teammate <laughs> who is an awesome off-roader himself. Not to mention, uh, he does monster trucks too, right? Uh, no, his brother does. Oh. He is a short course racer and pro Gotcha. Four. 
I always forget that there's two of them, but, yeah, uh, three. <laughs> I think, yeah. um, but, uh, but he comes from a family of, of those kind of extreme vehicle sports. Um, but, uh, but you're also in the, the teams themselves are, are well-stacked racers. They're not just random guys that this new sport just brought into the industry. No, definitely not. You know, you have Sebastian Loeb, Nasser, um, you have Christina Gutierrez, uh, you know, Tanner Faust, you have Lewis Hamilton owns a team, Nico Rosberg owns a team, Jensen Button. Uh, it's, it's a stacked field. And so the platform that you're all working with is, is it basically a spec platform? hundred percent spec, um, down to like bolts. It's crazy. They, uh, definitely, uh, they keep a tab on everything that we do to the cars, which is really awesome from a driver's perspective. Um, but yeah, it's a spec electric SUV series completely. And so they developed that platform for an, a couple years, at least, I think two or three years before they even launched the race series. Uh, they went through a lot of iteration, a lot of, uh, process there. Um, you know, when we talk about electric vehicles, the biggest, the first thing that everyone brings up is range, right? Like how, how long is this thing going to last? Like, yeah, electric can go fast. has a lot of torque. Uh, there's a lot of technology. Once you get a computer involved, you can do anything you want. But, um, you know, it's the first thing that everyone comes up with is, are you going to be pulling a generator with you to make it across the finish line? Like how, how are these cars performing and, and how long do you guys actually race like distance wise on these cars? Uh, so the racing that we're doing isn't distance. It's a two laps format, which is new. Actually, we only used to do one lap before, uh, longer courses, but now we're shorter courses, two laps. And it's really nice because you get a little bit more track time, but, uh, every time out it's about 20, 30 minutes. Um, so we're not really paying attention to the range of them, but, uh, definitely there's a lot of data. There's a lot of collection on the computer side of things. And it's a lot of figuring out how to make that work. Cause I honestly, I didn't do any of that until the series. So it's been a lot of learning for me with the engineers to figure out how to um, set up the vehicles and what needs to happen to have, you know, the front motor pull like the rear and make them work in sync and uh, what we're feeling on the track to be able to um, translate that to our engineers. So with a spec class, you know, the, the whole point of a spec class is you take away the vehicle and put it all on the racer, right? You're putting the performance on the racer by having everybody on a level playing field. But it, it sounds like to me that you're saying that there is a lot more teamwork that goes into these cars, um, even though they're a spec car. Yeah, hundred percent. So from the spec side of things, we're used to the mechanical side of spec, right? So it's like everything when it comes down to the arms, the geometry to, you know, where you're going to mount your shocks. Um, it, it's stuff like that, that makes it spec, the CCs, the, all that, but now it's a computer. So they have given us, I, I don't know how many channels exactly, but it's a few hundred channels compared to a few thousand that the car actually has. So you can work closely with your engineers to set up what you want your launches to be, what you want uh, the car to do in certain corners, the traction control when you have it cut in and out, what it feels. Um, there's still a lot to do uh, to the, make the vehicle 100% for what you would like as a driver. And then um, the suspension, you can change your clickers. You can put a different spring setups. There's three options, I believe, for spring setup. And now we have Fox on board, which is super awesome. Uh, and yeah, so there's still a lot to do. Even though it's a spec series, there's there's a lot you can change to make the car better, bigger, um, faster, whatever you possibly can. And you were with, uh, I think your car is a Hummer car, which is you know featuring the look and feel of the new EV Hummer which I think is probably one of the best looking cars on the, on the circuit right now. Yeah, definitely. We are the GMC Hummer EV program and our front clip, our front hood is a uh, Hummer EV uh, matching uh, with all the lights and everything. Um, yeah, it looks really good. I, I love the look for a car for sure. <laughs> so, so I watched uh, 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 over the last weekend, I watched a number of clips of Extreme E and it got rowdy this last time around. You guys were throwing down pretty hard out there. Uh, a lot of close misses, a lot of nose uh, wheelies, a lot of craziness going on out there. What's it like driving these cars on the course? And, and I mean, you're like you were saying, two laps is a short amount of time, especially when guys in the United States are thinking about short course racing where they do multiple laps and they get familiar with the course. They get they're familiar with the changes over time with the course where you're kind of like you get one shot, really. I mean, you get a second lap in the shorter courses, but you really have one shot to prove yourself on that before you basically lose. So what, what's it like different doing these cars and what's it like driving those cars? 
Yeah, these cars are definitely crazy to drive. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of a handful to say the least, but um, yeah, you only also have one or two laps. Like it's crazy. You don't have much track time at all. So you got to do a lot of horm- homework before you even get into the car. And then when you're in the car, you're like, all right, got to nail all of my points here because I only have this time out. And uh, so it's a lot of uh, definitely patience and uh, pressure on the driver to make sure that you uh, do that and you perform, you know. Um, there's also it's FIA spec, so they're very much watching every move you make. And there's a lot of penalties that can happen if you hit a flag or if you hit at all another car. And so everything at the end of a race, it comes down to, you know, like, okay, who got penalized? What happened? And then everything kind of like comes in full circle, you know, and there's, there's been a lot of carnage and, uh, it's, it's always been like, you never know what's going to happen in extreme eats to say the least. <laughs> yeah. It, it's pretty entertaining. And I think there's been a good amount of, uh, media coverage. Like they've, they've invested in covering the event. Um, it's not quite widespread in the United States as far as like on your Fox channel on the weekend, but it's it's definitely they're putting the effort in to make it a media friendly event and and the camera work and all that stuff is really top notch and i think watching it is it just it, it's very fan friendly in that aspect and i think that's important for a, a race series to grow and expand on um and and i appreciate it as somebody like what likes watching it uh but some of that car in car footage and and some of the rowdiness that gets around those corners and um how you can hole shot the the corners and get around people on those amazingly fast cars is, is pretty entertaining to watch. So, um, but one thing I did notice, uh, when on your recent trip is you guys did, went out and did some work cleaning up some areas and doing some, some charity work for the local area. Yeah. So that's one thing about extreme. That's absolutely awesome is that we aren't just there racing. We're there going to environmentally impacted areas. And we have a message along with our racing that we're trying to get out to the world and community. So where we went racing this last time in Chile was where the biggest copper mine is in the world. And we were in a desert that nothing can absolutely live out there. And it's the driest, oldest desert in the world. So it was a pretty crazy area. There's not much that uh, is out there. You just kind of see like moon rock and dirt pretty much. And, I was going to uh, say, do you feel um, like you were on the moon when you're out in the middle of that place? Yeah, definitely did. And so that's actually where NASA tra- um, trains a lot of their astronauts for the fact of uh, that there is no living organisms out there. And so that's how they train them on an area to look for anything that possibly could be alive for when they go to Mars or whatever the case is, because uh, that's a, such a non-livable area. And so kind of cool fact. So what kind of stuff did you guys do there uh, to help that that local area? I know you guys cleaned up some some water hole or something that was out there. Yeah. So we were cleaning up a water hole because, uh, there was, it's actually a freshwater spring, which freshwater out there is very scarce. And, uh, the fact that there's still fresh water in this little area is pretty awesome. And there's actually a frog, um, this special frog, which when you think of frogs, you're kind of like, okay, come on, you know, it's, but frogs are a good indicator of health and, uh, vibrance in life because they have poor skin and they have, uh, they, they can't live in a harsh environment. So the fact that this fresh water is coming up from the earth and this special species of frog can live in this area, that means that we need to kind of support it and it because it can help us live in an area like that and see what makes them thrive. So we can thrive as humans and the rest of the world. Um, but they were taking, uh, the mines were taking the fresh water at one point and using that for their mining. And then now they've trans changed all that and they're using salt waters because they don't need the fresh water. And they're realizing that when they were taking the fresh water, they were rooting species like this frog and, uh, the science that we can be learning from it on the backside. So it's, uh, been pretty cool to see that the mining companies out there, especially have transferred, um, a lot of their energies to sustainable energy and they're making change for the better to be able to, you know, mine more copper and also in a environmentally friendly way. So you've traveled the world, you've gone to different continents, you've done different race series, you've done different things. Uh, even personally, you've traveled, you know, to some pretty cool places. Um, you know, doing this EV thing with, with the race series, uh, and doing, having an environmental focus on it, has it changed your perspective on, on racing and, and how it impacts local areas like Baja or, or, you know, Africa or, or anywhere else? 
Uh, yeah, I definitely think that now I'm a lot more uh, conscious of what I'm doing in my normal life, what can help the environment. And one thing that I actually, I stand really big by is cleaning up our deserts and making sure that they're, uh, they're, they're friendly to the rest of the environment that we're, you know, using it for, we get to use it. So like, we want to keep it to where the animals in the area or whatever's living in that area can use it too, the same way we are. Um, so I actually partnered with Trad, Tread Lightly uh, recently to advocate for that. So it's kind of like, you know, don't leave your mark. Like when you go somewhere, pick up after yourself. When you leave, take care of the environment, do good for it and uh, recycle as much as you possibly can and uh, respect it. That's one of the messages that we always hit home on our podcast because we're big trail guys. We're big mountain guys. We like to be up in nature and be a part of um, the experience that most people don't get to have day to day. Uh, the sights, the smells, the experiences. Um, but every time we go up there, we're always finding, you know, people that went and partied or, or the 530 club that leaves it every 30 minutes on the trail or whatever. Um, and, you know, pack whatever you pack in, pack it out. Have a, one of the biggest things that people don't forget that people forget is a way to pack out what you bring in. You know, if you take a box of cans in with you, there's got to be something to put those cans back into. So, uh, you know, we got to respect these places or we'll lose them, especially in the United States. You know, when we're talking about the bureaucratic and the governments and the, and the different in industries that want to shut down what we do, uh, the fastest way to do that is to pollute our environment and to leave uh, a mark of where we've been. So um, ha hats off to the Extreme E guys and, and integrating uh, a, a mechanism to give back to their communities and their lands that they're they're basically making what they're doing off of. So um, I, I, I can't stress enough how important that is to give back to the communities and the local areas that we do these events in. Yeah, I agree. I totally uh, stand by it too. And I, I think it's awesome. Um, pack in, pack out, right? So just uh, take care of our deserts. So I mentioned earlier that you were the first woman on the Extreme E uh, side, but you've been the first woman across the board on a lot of things, including, you know, the X Games thing, the motocross wins, the uh, I mean, you were the winningest motocross gal in the uh, for a while there. I, are you still the the quickest uh, winning women? I don't, I don't know. I don't even know how to say it. Most winningest? Yeah, I think I am. <laughs> I, don't know. I, I don't really don't keep tabs on it, but I think so because back in the day is when they were doing like the most national circuits, and I don't think they're doing as many now. So I think so. So the reason I lead into that is, you know there's a big push to get young people into racing, especially in UTV, right? Because it's accessible now. Um, and uh, not only is it accessible, but you can get a really high performance car for comparatively little money and you can work and wrench on it yourselves. You don't need a big shop or anything like that. Um, and we've talked before in our show about, you know, what it means to be an athlete trying to get sponsored and what you should be doing on social and all these different responsibilities as a racer. Um, and, uh, I think it's important, uh, something I really respect, uh, a shameless plug for you. I, I, something I really respect is that you're a female athlete pushing hard in your industry without making your Instagram account a little bit risque. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of athletes that feel like they have to push that envelope to get the eyeballs, to get the, the likes and the follows that then support their, their sponsor sheet to the sponsors or whatever. Um, how important is it to have authenticity and and a, a level of respect in your social profiles as a female athlete in today's social climate? You know, this is a big topic and it is something I stand by. At times, it's kind of hard because if you are posing looking super beautiful and you wanted to maybe show a little bit more skin, I would, you know, I, ne I never really do. But at the same time, you can get a lot more likes. So you can grow a lot faster. And that is the way of the world anymore on social media. And I've chosen not to be that. I wanted people to look at me for my skill as a racer. I didn't want them to look at me for my looks. And so uh, there's times when, you know, I want to look marketable. I want to look beautiful. But at the same time, you see me today. I just got out of the gym, you know, I'm just kind of <laughs> like, I'm making this podcast and it's, this is who I am, you know? And, um, I have a lot of sponsors that, uh, reach out to me and they tell me from time to time, which is pretty awesome that they love it and they respect it very much. And it's super awesome, you know, and, and I think you have to make your own way through the industry and how you want to be represented. Do you want to be represented as kind of not sure if you can be taken seriously or be respected and be humbled and let them see you for what you want them to see you as. 
you know, because everything is perception when you put it out there in the world in today's age with social media. And I, uh, I definitely stand by letting my skill set and what I do do the talking and not uh, what my looks are. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding in the up and coming racers, uh, specifically the female racers, where they feel pressured because they may see, you know, a successful racer or somebody perceiving them, their accounts that way. Uh, but it's easy to get those follows. And so it's a, it's a quick turnaround. It's a quick satisfaction of, yeah, I grew 2000 followers. I grew 10,000 followers, whatever. Uh, I got a million likes on this or whatever. Uh, but when you're actually thinking about marketing yourself to a sponsor or to just the program or the sport in, in general, um, you know, you have a lot more to say as somebody that's put down the effort and proven themselves on the field with the product, with the car, with the whatever, than you would any time posing with, you know, a $50 sponsored product spot on your Instagram account. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And one thing that, you know, um, it, you might not see it right now. You might see the instant growth. You might see the gratification of that. But at the same time, when you get to a level of racing, like I have achieved, you have corporations that talk to you and they appreciate the way you carry yourself and the image that you've portrayed. And you're not this person that's taken us you know, something other than what they want to see in you because they're investing in you as a racer. They're not investing in you as a model or else they would just hire, hire someone who does that full time. Um, so, you know, it's a, uh, it, it isn't an easiest road, but it definitely is, I think the respectful way. And, you know, I go to bed pretty satisfied and happy at night knowing I didn't take the easy route because, uh, you know, that's just not who I am. That's not what I represent. And I've stayed true to that. Yeah. And, and there's not to say that there's not people that have a place in the industry to to show off, you know, a little bit more than others or to, you know, present themselves as more than just a racer. You know, we all want to see both sides. And if someone does, if that's who they are on the other side, that's that's fine. Uh, but I think it's important that we drive home with these up and comer racers, these parents that are raising young women to be athletes, that they they make sure to have that responsible side of you know, let's just be a little bit more reserved for now. And then when you're older, you can make those choices. And um, my biggest concern is just with the younger athletes, because there's so many of the younger athletes. I mean, I was talking to one family at an event not too long ago where their their five year old sons jumping RS ones. Like it's it's crazy what parents are starting to do nowadays because they can put a crazy cage on there and restraints and, and all that stuff and feel good that their kids are going to be safe in the car. But at the same time, you can push a kid too hard into a sport too fast, I think. And, uh, and especially for the young women on social media and things like that, it becomes kind of a, an important aspect for parents to consider. Um, and and as, as far as social media goes, you came from an era where social media wasn't like a thing with, with growing yeah. your sponsorships or your race scenes or creating content every day or, you know, making a reel every Saturday or, you know, all this other crazy stuff that we all are having to consider nowadays. Um, how has that changed who your program and how you approach your, your marketability as a racer for your brands? Yeah, it's definitely a hard, uh, a hard world out there, especially in the social media side, you gotta make sure that you have the great content contents, everything that's gold right now. Um, but like, it's the same thing, like we're talking about, it's the balance between, okay, let's make racing first. That's my priority. That's what I'm trying to obtain and reach goals of. And, you know, I want people to see my journey trying to do that, but I still need to keep racing focused number one. And so that is the challenge that I have to face all the time because content takes time. Content takes focus. Content takes, you know, all these things have to align in order to show them my journey of racing, you know, and even though that's my top goal, I got to figure out time for all these other things. And that is now, I think, the new normal. And uh, it's no longer, you know, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. You got to have the whole package. And that's the only way you can make it, especially in a world of off-road racing. But I think if you keep the respect for yourself and keep your goals aligned with what you really believe in and what you really want, I think other people see that and see you're true to that and they want to support it. So talking about content outside of your racing and people, how they portray themselves outside of that, you have a whole different side of your skill set where you're working as a stunt woman for different, you know, movies and, and whatever else. How did you get started in doing stunt driving and, and where is that taking you now? It's kind of crazy. I just got a call one day from a friend, Andy Bell, and he's like, hey, I'm working this commercial. My friend is for a big Super Bowl spot and they need a female that can ride motorcycles. And I only know you and Jolene. 
And Jolene's a good friend of mine and she also does stunts. She's a nitro girl and uh, nitro circus, which you guys have probably seen. Um, she's absolutely awesome. But um, so my first job was with her and I had no clue about this, this world of stunts in the movie industry. I did not know. Um, showed up for my first job and I got into the union because of it. And so it was right place, right time. And it's just kind of blossomed from there. People started learning that, hey, you know, she's a car racer now. So now I'm in car stunts a lot of the time or commercials and movies. And uh, I have so much to uh, thank that industry for because that has given me a great path to use my skill set that I've built off of racing motorcycles and all the stuff that I do on the other side. From, from racing to actually have a, a career elsewhere as well. So the first time I took notice of, of you doing a stunt thing, a stunt job was with the movie Jumanji. Uh, what was that like? And how did that all kind of come over? How did that all go down? Yeah. So I was on Jumanji with my good friend, Reese Millen, a fellow UTV racer, Polaris driver. And, um, it was a blast. We were out in Glamis just filming for nine days, I think it was. And uh, every morning we actually, we camped out on a uh, gecko and we just drove our razors to set every day. So that's how we got to work. It was pretty, pretty awesome. So, so in that movie, I think they have a, a chase scene or something with the, uh, with the razors and, and you guys had some pretty gnarly modified looking cars and whatnot. And uh, was it basically just running down a script or like you need to go from point A to point B, make that churn? Like, was it, or was it just like free flow and like, hey, just be crazy and go from this point to that point? I have to say, because me and Reese work so well together, we're like the same person. He's the male version of me to an extent, and I'm the female version of him. That when uh, we were on set, our second unit director, uh, Wade Eastwood, he just pretty much was like, you guys know this desert. You guys just go for it and we'll just figure it it out for the most part if we find something cool let us know and we'll just uh we'll do that and if we need like a transition shot that we're looking for then we'll just let you guys know and you know they kind of winged a lot of it which was pretty awesome because they they put the trust in what we thought and uh it turned out really good because yeah it was a, a scene where the ostriches are chasing us over the dunes and they're trying to eat us pretty much <laughs> 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 so glamis has been kind of one of those places where every a couple of years some big movie actually shows up and records there um as as a destination point um you know that's starting all the way back to like star wars right like it's kind of like this epic place where just people keep going back to um do you find glamis as a, a special place for you or is that kind of um do you have another place where your heart is no, Glamis is special to me. I grew up going to the river and to Glamis, which, you know, it's kind of funny. I just moved to Arizona from California, me and my boyfriend, Ricky, and uh, we bought property on the river. So now I have the desert and I have the river where the two places that I grew up going to my entire life with my family, my dad and mom took me always there and my brother. And now I have those two places in my life later in life. <laughs> well, that's definitely a testament to, you know, achieving your goals, right? Like being able to actually afford to do what you, uh, what makes you feel good in places that make you feel good. And, and, um, it's a, it's a definite evidence of pursuing and grinding and grinding and grinding and doing what you know is right. And, and what you know is true to your goals and yourself. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about those upcoming racers and those people that want to get into this more, uh, larger racing versus just a local racing, right? Is there any kind of tips or any kind of like recommendations that you can have that you've learned over the years that now having experienced, you know, pre social media and grinding hard on the moto to working your way all the way up to this amazing, like super funded EV setup? Um, you know, is there anything that we can have as a takeaway as a community of things that we should take into consideration or have learned from your experiences? You know, you kind of just nailed it. Um, it's something I actually recently just had a coming back moment to focus on. And it's, you know, sometimes when you get to a certain level, you have a lot of noise. You have a lot of people telling you what they think you need to be doing or what they feel and, you know, vice versa. But the one thing I think that everyone should always try to do is as long as their focus is in the right spot and their goals are in the right place, they need to always do what they feel is right to do in their heart for themselves, for the racing, for whatever it takes to reach their goals is always stay true to you because there's going to be so many times, you know, you hear with uh, musicians probably all the time, you know, like they had their, 
their vibe of music and then they get these big sign labels and then they're kind of like, okay, we want uh, you to sound this way. And I think one thing that I think is, uh, is awesome is to stand by what you believe in, because, you know, like I have on my social media, I stand by what I believe in. I want to be the racer. I want to be respected in that way. And, uh, I think people see that. So the followers I do have, they, they love it. And, you know, I have a lot more little girls probably paying attention to those things and their parents and, you know, they're, they're showing on my social media cause they want them to be like that or to look up to that. And that feels really good, you know, and, and you all can do the same. So in my show prep, doing a little deep dive into some YouTube videos and various different, uh, historical, uh, pieces, I ran across a little video of you uh, doing some uh, play-by-play calling on uh, some uh, green screen stuff. And I, I seem to remember a, oh. a, a, quote, <laughs> a quote of something like the smell of churros is in the air and it's delicious or something like that. Uh, <laughs> what, uh, I know what you're talking about. The, it was a video game that I did. Uh, yeah, play-by-play. It was like the instruction guide to how to play this video game. <laughs> so so you had these you had this idea that maybe going into broadcast commentating uh may have been a path you were going to follow is that something you still aspire to be in you know i always get thrown into that place i don't think it's for me like i'm definitely <laughs> down to be a spokeswoman but i don't think that i'm a commentator or i'm someone who can be like you know, I don't know, reading scripts totally. Like I, I can do the whole endorsement thing. I love that. I love representing products and I love being, um, you know, saying what I would say, but when it comes down to having to be on the green screen or, be, <laughs> uh, you know, perform and talk in a certain way or commentate, I don't, I don't think it's for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you nailed the, uh, the memorable quotes part of that. So we'll have to, we'll have to inject that clip into the, the podcast here. Um, <laughs> But uh, looking at uh, kind of where your career has taken you and, and just kind of the spread that you've had, um, is there anything still that you're looking to actually accomplish? Yeah, the car. I really want to get to the car. Um, I, I've i been trying to since I got back from Africa in 2015, and it's just really hard as an American. You're kind of disconnected from that whole world. But uh, being an extreme E has brought me in the forefront of a lot of people involved in it. Uh, my boyfriend races it too. So, but he's on the dirt bike side, so it's a little different, but yeah, a little that's, more gnarly too. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> he's, he's crazy, but I definitely, yeah, would love to get to the car. So do you, so I think it was, a, was it last year or the year before that it was like the first time Kristen Matlock had gotten to the, the car and, and was factory sponsored to go and do all that. I th- was she the first American woman to do the car? I can't remember. I would think so. So, um, I'm trying to think, no, maybe American woman, at least in UTV. I have to look, uh, yeah, I'd have to look because there's quite a few females that I don't think get enough uh, credibility. Like you to Kleinsmith, she actually races extremely. She was the first female to ever win Dakar. Um, then then you have Lia signs. She did it on the motorcycle. You have Christina Gutierrez. Uh, you there's, there's a lot of navigators, um, I don't know the names, but there's a lot of female navigators. There's also drivers. I'd have to really do my research. I really don't know. <laughs> well, I think Dakar is is definitely one of those for any kind of racer it would be a you know a bucket list item and and such a such a big, grand, amazing race that you know our culture here in the states just doesn't understand what they do over there and how big of a deal it is for them over there. Um, and you know with the with the recent over the last few years how they've changed courses and they've changed locations and stuff has really mixed things up. And um, I can't imagine that the next one's going to be anything less than as amazing. So um, I wish you the best of luck to get to there. I, I definitely want to see your race there. Um, and uh, maybe even in a, in a Polaris or something. But <laughs> the uh, um, do you think you'd want to race that in in a truck or in a in a SSV? I would like to do it in a UTV, I think, because mechanically, I know them very well. Um, preferably would love to do it in a Polaris Razor, but I'm not sure when, um, or if, you know, the Polarises are going there, um, as well as, you know, Can-Am kind of rules the market there. So right. I, uh, you know, I want to go compete with them. So, uh, you have the extreme E thing going on. Do you, and then what's your next, uh, big event that you're going to be doing up, uh, here soon? So right now is actually we're prepping right now for Sonora Rally. So I'm going to be doing that in my Turbo R. And yeah, 
we're getting ready. That's uh, my my training I do every year, just in case I do ever get that Dakar ride call. <laughs> so going from Extreme E to this amazing big high power platform that's extremely heavy and but yet also very powerful down to a super lightweight and also extremely powerful platform. Is there any adjustment that you have to make or is it gotten to a point where you can pretty much just jump in and out? Um, I think it's definitely just a matter of whatever I have going on that day. I just kind of put that in my brain and it's just like these switches. <laughs> You're like the old computers where you put the, the slot in and the, the disc in and, and load it up. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. I have like a little pep talk with myself and I come up with a plan in my brain and, you know, I even have a performance mental coach and she helps me kind of simplify things. So like whatever I have going on that day, when there's a lot of uh, stuff going on, it's kind of like, she helped me narrow it down to be like focused here. So you said that you got back from the gym this morning to, to do the podcast today. Uh, and you just came off a flight and, and a, this big, long trip and everything. Uh, but it speaks to how important health and fitness is in racing. Like it, it seems like a lot of us would just say, well, yeah, duh, that, that seems to make sense. You need to be fit for racing. But a lot of racers um, just think that they can wrench all week and then go race without having any fortitude to look at, you know, endurance and, and stamina in the in the seat. Uh, how important is physical health and well-being to you? You just said you had a mental coach. Like you're, you're obviously investing in your your well-being when it comes to performance. Yeah, your performance is everything. Um, coming from motocross, you know, it was 24-7. That was what motocross was, which is actually really crazy to think about. Now it's not as much a physical thing, but it's still definitely a mental thing. You know, like when I raced the Baja 1000, I did every mile. It took me 19 and a half hours in the truck. So Obviously you gotta have some mental conditioning and physical conditioning to do that. But, uh, you don't ever want to get to the line or think like it's too hot today for me, or I'm not fit enough for this or like, man, I can't breathe. Like why, why not be your fittest to not even have that be in your, your brain or even a question. And so that's just out of the picture now for me, you know, I'm always hundred percent ready when you're traveling, you're tired, you're, you have all these things happening. There's there's things that your body's not used to when you're in those uh, situations trying to be race ready. So if you can be the fittest you can, that, that just crosses those out. And then, yeah, the mental side is everything in racing, truthfully. So yeah, my performance coach has been a great help to me. I think, um, it just, uh, especially when I'm learning so many new things like the data and extreme e vehicles, you know, it's it, sometimes I'm like, okay, this is a lot to kind of take on right now. Like, let me focus on the things that I need to know right now as a driver. And so she kind of helps me delegate, you know, you know, a way to absorb it all in the way that benefits myself. So when we look at high performance racing teams and, and whatnot, you look at places like Red Bull and, and Monster and all these guys where they're, they're starting to invest in these like, performance programs for their top tier athletes, right? Where you've seen the the crazy Red Bull, like uh, hit the buttons, performance metrics and all these other things that they're starting to do. Um, you know, obviously we can't all be at that level of investment, but uh, are there any takeaways for the racers out there that you've learned over the years where it's like more important to invest in one way or the other? You said mental is very important. Yeah. Mental is everything. I think if uh, you were to invest in anything, your mental is uh, number one. And if, you know, like I've always been strong willed, I've always been fearless and I've always been willing to do whatever it takes, like my arms falling off, I'd still finish a race kind of person. Um, but, you know, I think sometimes when you can't do it necessarily the way you've always known how, and then you're trying to evolve and you're trying to adapt. It's kind of like, yeah, I got to figure out a way to make all this work better or as best as I possibly can, because it's only going to help you be better and perform on the track. Cause you definitely want to be winning, right? That's the reason why we're racing is we all want to be the best and uh, you can never be, uh, you can never stop being better to be honest. So yeah, I think definitely mental is everything. And I think uh, the physical side, if you can just be fit to just cross that out of your mental, then you're ahead. So in your off time, besides laying in the river, uh, what do you like to do uh, to kind of get your mental energy out? Um, yeah, I love the river. We go surfing a lot <laughs> whenever we do get the chance. Um, but besides that, uh, boy... Do you even I have time live. for anything else? I, yeah, not really. Like, to be honest, I hang out with my family and friends, but, um, yeah, pretty much it's, uh, just surfing out in the river or 
going somewhere else in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> Is there uh, any desert area that you have not explored or part of the country that you've not explored that you want to get out to? I haven't done mud bogging yet. <laughs> That'd be interesting to see you on the race course, uh, the mud, the mud courses and to see how you do there. They have some pretty hopped up machines and NOS and everything on those things. Yeah, they're pretty wild. I've seen it. I'm like, I want to go there one time. I need to, me and Super ATV have been trying to make it happen for some time. And I'm like, guys, I really need to go <laughs> mud bog. Um, so are there any kind of, uh, events that you're looking forward to this year besides the race circuit or do you, uh, pretty much like you, I think you did trail hero last year or the year before, um, you're going to be making it out for that. I'm not, I'm, um, trail hero was so much fun too, but, uh, I think, uh, I have Sonora, I get back from Sonora, then it's going to be, um, getting ready for probably camp razor and the off-road motorsports hall of fame. And then I go to my last round of extreme E and then after that, it's kind of the end of the year for me, um, which will be a month of kind of relaxing, getting to be with the family, but then also probably finish up our move from moving to Arizona <laughs> and, uh, you know, planning next year, it's going to be all happening very fast. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and speaking of camp razor, uh, that's awesome because it's finally back, right? Like it, it was knocked out of, uh, our, our schedules for a couple of years and now it's back and, you know, I, I would not be surprised if, if Polaris doesn't go big uh, this year at Razor, uh, Camp Razor. So if you can make it out to Camp Razor, uh, definitely probably going to be one of the biggest events of the year. So um, check that out. Uh, Sarah, how can we uh, follow you online? How can we follow your progress and uh, your racing and the Extreme E and all that stuff? So all my social channels are just Sarah Price MX on anything. And then also my website is sarahpricemx.com. So pretty much always on my social channels, posting stuff and it's very entertaining. So go follow it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And uh, so uh, you guys, if you're listening to this episode, you can obviously find it on Apple iTunes um, you can, or podcasts, Google podcasts, all the different places, iHeartRadio. Uh, Spotify, those things. And if you would like to uh, see what Sarah Price looks like after a gym workout, you can follow us on YouTube as well. Um, and uh, we would just like to say if you um, like this episode, give us a thumbs up. And if not, uh, give us a thumbs down. Uh, but I'm pretty sure everybody's going to love Sarah's episode here. She's done great today. Uh, Sarah, thanks for joining me today. It's been a, a pleasure and an honor to have you uh, give up your time. And especially after that long trip and getting back home literally a day ago. So thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. All right, guys, uh, till next time, peace.